a very warm welcome to you all from our team team csp uh, i would like to introduce uh, professor sangeeta menon who will be uh, talking about this brand new initiative by our team uh, professor sangeeta menon is the head and dean of uh, consciousness studies program school of humanities at national institute of advanced studies i would invite ma'am to speak further on this brand new series by our team yeah namaste and uh, good evening all of you uh, i see about uh, 43 people <laughs> at this point given that we live in an age uh, of a very great competition of so many webinars and lectures i think 46 people is a good audience for you rohan somji uh, and uh, we are inaugurating uh, this uh, nias consciousness studies program uh friday lectures with our young speaker rohan somji who is going for further studies to the us and i'm sure he will be introduced very soon uh well we have lectures and lectures and why did we have uh friday lectures and what is the speciality about it we thought often we see lectures by um people who have accomplished and uh, uh you know who have re uh, reached a certain age and um, uh exposure but uh, there are many young scholars like rohan somji for instance uh, who are very bright and uh, who can think about uh, very complex questions in life in a very detailed and uh, intricate manner at the same time in a very communicative manner so this forum is essentially for young scholars good communicators great thinkers and you are also able to influence the society and community with their thoughts so after reading rohan somji's uh, publication which uh, came in philosophy now it is a fascinating article based on the greek thinkers i thought he would be the right person to start the nia csp friday lectures and that's why we are here and in case you have a suggestion for a nia csp friday lecture please contact uh, niharika sharma or meera kumar with your suggestion uh, we definitely welcome young scholars but of course young can also have a spectrum so i leave it to you but we definitely would look forward to many young scholars Uh, coming to this forum and sharing their thoughts and ideas with us thank you niharika thank you ma'am uh, i would now like to invite uh, uh, meera kumar menon who will uh, give a small uh, introduction for our speaker our first speaker for this series meera please um good evening everyone so uh, i would like to introduce our first speaker uh, of the session rohan somji uh, rohan is a philosophy graduate from mumbai university and uh, he is currently headed to georgetown university uh, for pursuing his um, for for working with this department uh, of communication culture and technology and uh, he's currently uh, reading into intersection of ai and continental philosophy so we are very happy to have you uh, rohan and what intrigued us about you uh, at least uh, as scholars in csp was the um, was the article that you published in philosophy now which was quite fascinating so uh, in the introduction itself he says uh, about a philosopher and he says a philosopher is someone who has deep questions as opposed to other people who might have straightforward ones so uh, i'm pretty sure that rohan is a curious mind and he also says by the end of the um, article that enhancing awareness is uh, one of the aims of philosophy and it defines humanity so i'm sure you will enhance our awareness of how we think and why we think and all of that so welcome rohan we are very happy to have you welcome rohan uh, i would now request you to start begin your lecture we are eagerly waiting for your lecture so we shall begin it uh thank you uh, meera and niharika for those kind words i really hope that uh, i will be able to enhance some some modicum of awareness maybe today with this lecture that i have uh, i would also like to thank uh, sangeeta ma'am for uh, actually tracking me down and uh, 
availing me of this uh, opportunity for this lecture. So thank you. So my topic today is uh, why do we think? Now, uh, the fundamental way of looking at thinking, and this is why I selected this topic, the fundamental way of looking at thinking has always been as a way to obtain thought. Uh, nothing more, nothing less. It has always been that thinking has been a medium through which you labor, uh, a mere laboring to ultimately obtain a thought. And in, in this, this outlook of uh, looking at thinking, if one could entirely do away with this, with this laboring and just directly get to thought, uh, such an event would be regarded as an accomplishment. Uh, just think about uh, a, a new brand new iPhone design that you could simply get to uh, without having to wait unnecessarily for this uh, brilliant thinker to labor for an entire year. Uh, now such a thought is so simple. Uh, yet it's so misguided. Uh, today for the next 30 minutes, I would, I would like you to regard thought as, as a side matter and thinking as the main subject matter. Thought has been regarded as the subject matter for centuries now. Today, I would like to posit to you that thinking is more than thought. In fact, if I may be so bold, I would like to posit that, that thinking can stand on its own. For the next 30 minutes, I would like you to shift your attention to thinking, not, not thoughts generated, but the thinking that generates thought. I want us all to consider these questions together and, uh, and proceed from answer to answer, taking every possible wrong turn if we have to. Uh, because as it turns out, uh, this question is much more complicated than it seems at the face value. Uh, so I do not wish to suggest that by the end of 30 minutes, uh, we will have got the answer to this, this tremendous question. Now, the question can be asked, what is, what is thinking? What is the intent behind thinking? In a, in a contextual sense, we can ask what has historically been, uh, at least in the Western tradition, the intent behind thinking? Uh, what end do we achieve by our thinking? What is the use of thinking? These are, these are various manifestations of the same question. What is, what is thinking trying to grasp? Now, when I began paying heed to these questions, I began thinking about the Greeks in a, in a strange and unusual way. Uh, now this lecture is thinking about thinking. So I would like to first point out that when I say I began thinking about the Greeks, I, I haven't begun thinking per se. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm uh, thinking is a shorthand that I'm using for remembering and reconstructing the information that I had about the Greeks. So just consider my meditation on the Greeks as a playground where we can set up the apparatus to determine what thinking can do or what thinking does or what thinking aims to do. Uh, now there are a number of playgrounds such as this. Uh, I chose the Greeks because I could see something, something uh, unusual over there. Uh, I could see a, a, a connection between the trace idea that I had about thinking and uh, a possible reason why, and maybe I suspected that the same strange reason was probably at play when the Greeks, when a lot of the Greeks did not write. When I say they did not write, what I mean is they did not write treatises. They did not, they did not present theses. We, we may regard them as such, but, but if you look at the language, the language has always been poetic. They, they have either written in the form of aphorisms or they have written outright poetries. So I began wondering what, what is it that made them pursue this in, in this, this particular manner? Now, to understand the Greeks, we need to first understand what, what thinking really means. If we need to get to the primordial meaning of thinking. So to understand how to think, what do we intend to do with it? Only after understanding these things can we fathom the limits to which the Greeks uh, stretch thinking. So first we need to clear the ground. So let me ask you right now, uh, are we thinking right now, right? This, this moment, 
I don't think so. We are we are listening. I'm talking and listening to your response, but none of us are really thinking right now. Not in the proper sense of the word thinking. At least not the way the Greeks meant it. Uh, occasionally, a thought does enter our mind, but if we if we look at it clearly, if we uh, really inspect it, we realize that it's a, it's a memory. Uh, maybe it came about uh, because of something I said. Maybe it came about because uh, um, something around me or about me reminded you of something. But this is not yet thinking. We we need to be clear because we need to get to what thinking is. We need to be precise about what thinking is. So, but we are sure. We are we are sure that we have thought once before. If if not before, at least once we have thought. So. so go to a moment of of deep thinking that you had surely here nobody can deny that thinking went on here we can certainly assert that thinking went on so here maybe we can we can go ahead and ask thinking why why is it that we think in the first place okay so let's get concrete in in midst of this deep thinking we occasionally dawn upon an idea so surely conceiving an idea has to be thinking but how do we conceive an idea this is important unless unless we understand the source the motivation and the process of this deep thinking we we cannot understand the reason behind thinking so again how how do we conceive an idea how how do we think anything uh we don't know that as yet we are still thinking we are in the process of it what we do know now is that we cannot simply will an idea into existence i mean if if you are aware that you have an idea in your mind you cannot simply summon your will to bring it forth what you have to do generally is think of a lot of unrelated things uh think of a lot of thoughts and slowly coax the idea into existence so the ideas are delicate this way now the this this idea of thinking other things to to bring about the idea into existence isn't this generally uh, uh, a eureka moment the kind of moment that archimedes had when he when he was entering the bath tub and suddenly he jumps forth screaming eureka this in this moment he has just realized unthinkingly in a way while he's thinking about something else entirely that the water displaced in the bath tub is the exact amount as that which is required when he is entering the bath tub so the weight of the water displaced is the same as the weight of his body now th- these eureka moments uh aren't these often called inspiration now since inspiration is what leads the way to an idea and so far in our in our process of trying to figure out what thinking is we went from uh thinking uh discarded memory and uh, we reached to idea we said that at least conceiving an idea is definitely thinking in our deep thinking conceiving an idea is thinking so then should we go a step ahead and say that since inspiration is what leads the way to an idea since inspiration is the process through which the idea comes about is inspiration thinking now i already know that at this point this is getting absurd inspiration is what makes one think inspiration is certainly not thinking itself it it cannot be the essence of thinking so we have to ask then what what does inspiration make happen is if inspiration isn't thinking then what is inspiration making happen that we can refer to as thinking so if we we get the answer to this we get the answer to all our previous questions how do we conceive an idea how do we think anything maybe once we know how we do it we uh, we can know why do we do it in the first place so so i have a candidate how about reflection uh we are inspired to reflect and in our reflecting we find thinking so i posit to you that we only truly find thinking in reflecting so now we know something reflection is the ground on which thinking appears a little boy looks up at the stars not in an observatory uh studying the movements of planets but but standing on the rooftop staring at the sky it occurs to him 
how how large the spaces between the stars are how how deep that darkness between the two stars does that extend into and simply how vast those dark spaces might in reality be because if each of those tiny stars is billions of kilometers in, uh, in diameter just think about how how huge those vast empty dark spaces that fill the entire universe are now you can go ahead and ask me what is so special about this this kind of reflection uh and and the only way that i can answer this is is, is that if you go back to the moment to the to the moment of reflection where where uh you were in that experience you can undeniably see that it is almost always this this profound sense of of mystery that that little boy will never be able to explain what is it that he found so mystifying about those dark spaces i mean someone here surely will could explain uh, that uh, there's nothing uh, between the two stars which is why it's black which is why there is a dark space uh, the answer is nothing or someone could go ahead and say that the answer is dark matter or uh, give a reduction of scientific explanation but uh, to experience that that uh, that mystery that the boy is undergoing is only possible if you juxtapose yourself at that moment now in that same sentence the sentence where we say that there, it's nothing between the stars it's a uh, it's empty space which is why you see it as black we can experience that same that sentence as mundane but it is impossible for you to step into the experience of that little boy experiences and i'm sure many of us over here have had and uh, and actually experience that moment as mundane so we find in this moment the mundane as the mysterious uh we reflect on why things are the way they are and how far does the darkness stretch into the night and uh, where do thoughts come from all of these sorts of questions are transformed from uh mundane and silly to profound and deep just by this this shift that seems to come and go as it pleases but how does the mundane transform into the mysterious this is what we are chasing we, we have to remember that we are still on track to figuring out what uh, why is it that we think what is it that is prompting this thinking so we have to answer this question why uh, how is it that the mundane is transforming into the mysterious how is something that is that is uh, that is a silly question in our day to day affairs is uh, suddenly becomes a deep question for us uh, if we are in this moment of reflection now if you again go back to your experience you realize that the mundane was always mysterious uh, that this this wave that you had of it being mundane was simply that a wave now we we experience this astonishment because we we feel like how did we miss this in the first place uh before this moment for example countless time, times i've thought but i've never thought about why is it that i think now that i look at this question i see how absurd it is how confusing it is how infuriating it is that it's taking uh, it's it's already taking what 15 minutes for us to slowly penetrate it to this question so and this is the same question that is now appearing as the mysterious so naturally we have to ask what what made us notice of it what made us notice this question why why did we get interested in the first place what interested us in it and still we don't know that as yet we are still in the process of thinking so we asked in the beginning why did some of the greeks not write and if they did they often wrote poetry or had conversations which would then be uh, recorded in the form of dialogues like like plato's dialogues they didn't write in the sense that they didn't write a treatise or present a thesis at least not until aristotle in 385 bc for 300 years pre aristotle from philosophers like thales and anaximander we saw poetry capturing the essence of truth 
the, the Greek, the, the word that the Greeks used for the truth with the capital T was aletheia. And aletheia meant the same thing as unconcealing. Aletheia unconcealed itself to the Greek thinker, which the Greek thinker then expressed in the form of poetry. It's again, expression is not the same thing as what we mean today. Where it's a mere a romantic uh, engagement that has nothing to do with our uh, actual engagement. Expression and engagement are two separate things. You can express post your engagement. But for the Greeks, expression and engagement are part of the same process that is diving deep into thinking. They did write uh, treatises in prose because the point was never to uh, create these uh, standalone thought systems as we often attribute to these uh, prior thinkers, which would explain the workings of the world. What they were engaged in, rather, is listening, listening to thinking, and occasionally speaking what they heard. And when I say listening to the thinking, I do, don't even, I'm not even using the sentence, listening to their thinking. To the Greeks, the thinking presented itself to them. This is the reason why the ancient Greek thinkers were poets. They, they possessed poetic thinking. The point of their thinking was to draw themselves and the ones around them towards this, this sense of mystery. By fixating themselves on this, the, the Greeks developed an outlook of nature that, that we have never witnessed since. The term that they used was, was phusis, that's P-H-Y-S-I-S. Phusis is the same word that, that now later gives rise to the word physics, uh, which Aristotle refers in his metaphysics. And uh, it's the same word that gives rise to the distinction between the physical and the non-physical. But even though the physical, the root word of physical is phusis, uh, for Greeks, the phusis, now, now look carefully at the definition. Phusis is defined as that which appears naturally that which comes about ahead in front of us naturally. This does have signs of being a physical, a physical thing, but for the Greeks, it was so much more than physical. It was, it was an ever revealing, ever appearing sense of nature that they had. So when they have their minds bent towards this fusis, this fusis, which is generating the sense of mystery inside them, uh, any other activity other than fixing their gaze on this mystery, of moving this, uh, of uh, moving this gaze, would be like leaving uh, leaving this careful and fragile examination that is required. Moreover, this movement to reach to the core of our thinking is is a very personal process. Mind you, I do not use I'm not using the word subjective or uh, um, any other word. I, I'm I'm simply saying a personal process because it happens within an individual. So. In, in this process, you will often see that the Greeks uh, found themselves in conversations with citizens, facilitating this move towards the mysterious, but never one of indoctrinating it. So to Socrates, for example, uh, the, the father of uh, Western philosophy, the, the point was the method of dialectic, the process of genuine examination. Socrates, if you recall, for the philosophy uh, students out there, uh, started by questioning the premises of the interlocutor, right? Steadily, he starts pointing out the flaws in, in the interlocutor's premises and his conclusions. Now, he keeps on doing this until the interlocutor is left in this total state of bewilderment with his complete, uh, with, uh, I mean, he is shocked with the total lack of knowledge that the interlocutor now has of himself. The, before he met Socrates, the interlocutor would be so shocked that uh, about what he knew that he would never really fathom that even the most simplest basic of certainties would, would come under question suddenly. Uh, certainties like uh, what is the meaning of love or what is the meaning of courage? What is, what is bravery? Uh, what is beauty? Uh, of course, what is good and what is bad? What is good for me? What is bad for me? And suddenly all of these basic concepts would come into question with Socrates in front of you. Now, if you look at this text, uh, at any of these dialogues, you'll see that Socrates' aim was not the formulation of these specific set of terminologies that one would use uh, in their arsenal for argumentation. The, 
this this method was a sophist Socrates decried throughout his entire life now in socrates's dialectic what rather happened was an ex- was was not an ex- uh, was not an exercise in conjuring of thoughts to bringing about thoughts though he did refer to himself as the as the midwife but what he instead did was facilitate this birth in thinking and what what this did for the interlocutor was it pushed him to the inner core of the question that he possessed that he did not even know that he possessed till then maybe he came with a basic question but he left with a deep and profound question by the end and i mean think about it if if one knew something then there is no need to think further but if one questioned it really questioned it then there is a need a need to think now and then and only then can thinking really begin so only after admitting a lack of knowledge can one really begin thinking about something now if if you really start from this position of uh, and this is the part that uh, a lot of people don't really talk about if you start from this absolute position of not thinking it's not just a matter of pride or uh, a matter of uh, uh, just simple humility uh, what happens is if you have an and you start moving maybe you what happens is you start uh Uh, is is there some problem rohan uh we can't hear you is you are unmuted from my end i think you have to unmute yourself i have done the needful here Okay, let me just try. Let me just try, Rohan. Just hold on. I hope you are unmuted. I'm going to mute all and then come back to you and mute, unmute you. Yeah. Okay. You can hear me now, right? Sorry, sorry about that glitch. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> so. yeah <clears throat> so yeah, only after you admit a complete lack of knowledge uh you find yourself in this state where where you can encounter something that the greeks called uh tau mazain tau mazain is uh uh it's spelled as t h a u m a z e i n now tau mazain uh, is what we would today call a sense of wonder 
or, or a sense of uh, deep astonishment. Uh, but uh, this word is used almost exclusively with respect to the deepest of wonders and the most heart striking of astonishments. Uh, Aristotle, for example, notes in, uh, in his metaphysics that it is owing to their Taumazine that men both now begin and at first began to philosophize. We wanted to understand why would some of the Greek thinkers not write? They didn't write because they were in the rapture of Taum design. In For the Greeks, philosophy began with Taum design. And for them, it stayed with Taum design, at least for 300 years. Now, they, they would have their gaze fixed on the sense of wonder that they had. And never once would they glance away from it. Even, even Heidegger uh, remarks on this, uh, in his remarks about Thales, uh, in his travelogues to Greece, uh, he mentions that Thales, he is that person so struck by the overabundance of the world of the stars that he was compelled to direct his gaze to the heavens alone. In the Greek climate, the human is so overwhelmed by the presencing of what is, of what is present, that he is compelled to the question concerning what is present as simply as what is present. The Greeks named this relation to this, this thrust of presence as Taumazine. Now, from the moment that they caught this Taumazine in their thinking, the only thinking that they could be bothered with to teach was the thinking that aims to move one closer to this mystery. So if one is drawn closer to this mystery with each thought, you can understand how it's almost detrimental to step out of that, that stream, that flow, and note down what they learned on the way. It's, it's almost like uh, stopping meditation, to note down the various thoughts that you're having and the various experiences that you're undergoing. Now, though these notes might be quite useful, you have to recognize that they are, they are remnants from you know, compared to the gaze that we have set on the source of these, uh, these insights. Now, the source is what the Greeks referred to as nature. Simply, they refer to it as nature or fusis. This, this fusis was an active element for the Greeks. It, uh, it was the renderer of mysteries. It, it is what prompted thinking. And so any other direction would be a stepping away from the essence of thinking. Now what this stepping away constitutes in would again be personal. And at what point and at what turn in one's own thinking does one lose contact with this uh, Taumazine and chases a thought for the sake of itself is again quite personal, which is why we have all of these divergences in the Greek thought. We have, we have skeptics and uh, living with the cynics and uh, the um, uh, the Heracletians and uh, uh, students of Plato at the entire academy and you have all of these various branches of thought but all of them are still fixed in Thomas. It's, it's only post-Aristotle that the examination of Fusis remember Fusis is the root word for, uh, for the physical again. So Fusi, the examination of Fusis only post-Aristotle gets divided into the physical and the metaphysical. To the Greeks before the distinction would, would never have occurred. They would have been confounded by this distinction. Uh, since the experience of Fusis was, was never really of the merely physical, it was always ever revealing, ever present over them. It was a thriving and ever revealing appearing of nature. So the appearing was a profound appearing for the Greeks. It wasn't merely that which is there in front of you. Now, it is only after, after René Descartes in the 17th century, uh, whom we consider the father of modern philosophy, that, that we see the introduction of this new notion called the subject. We have this distinction between the subject and the object and suddenly the mind of the subject is introduced. And the moment the mind of the subject is introduced, the ontological value of Fusis, the existential value of Fusis is reduced. It's reduced to the, to the mere subjective appearance of the merely physical. Now, for the majority of the period following this, we have, in a sense, forgotten the original intent behind thinking. Even today, thought 
and I keep on saying we and the Western tradition because the Western tradition is what is also responsible for modern technology and uh, this entire global communications atmosphere. So when we have forgotten the original intent behind thinking, I mean that we have forgotten the original intent behind thinking in the Western tradition. And so even today, when we look at thought, we look at thought again in its most usefulness. In fact, uh, we can ask what use can we gain out of this lecture. Now, simply in terms of usefulness, we, we keep thinking about thinking only in terms of how useful it is or what kind of thought can we produce out of it. And yet, because we are out of touch with the most uh, useless yet uh, overwhelming experience of Tao Mazayan or wonder, we chase thoughts almost exclusively, but we never chase thinking. Now, if anything ha in, uh, about this, this scrutiny of the source, source of thinking has revealed for us is that there is a larger possibility for thinking. And there is a different relation to the world that we have within this thinking. Now, Greek thinking, just as an example, has revealed a different relation to the world, to the world as Fusis, a world where thinking led to, uh, to a disclosure of nature and unconcealing that the Greeks called Aletheia or truth with a capital T. This uh, unconcealing and truth for the Greeks were the same thing because when nature presented itself, it presented itself concealed sometimes and we did the job of unconcealing it. Uh, we still don't know what, what thinking aims to do exactly. And in this sense, it will, it might always be incomplete. Uh, as it is, Tao Mazayan's uh, bleak presence is what initiates, continues to initiate in us the most trivial of our everyday thoughts. But right after that, right after we, uh, after Tao Mazayan has prompted a thought in us, uh, the rest of the thoughts that we have are just runaways from these, from this Tao Mazayan because our thinking is not directed towards Tao Mazayan. Our thinking towards Tao Mazayan is what gets us closer to the original intent of thinking. Now we are not thinking as yet, even by the end, but maybe we will think again, uh, directly responding to this Tao Mazayan. This Tao Mazayan is, is only available in a private moment and I really doubt it if it, if it comes about in a public discourse, but uh, for the moment when, when Tao Mazayan does come about, I hope that when it provokes us, we continue thinking in its path. Now, as to the question, why do we think? The answer is because something simply prompts us to and we are heading its way. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rohan, for the wonderful lecture. I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Saurabh Todaria, the chairperson of this session. Uh, he has completed his PhD in philosophy from uh, JNU, Delhi. His, uh, his area is phenomenology and uh, transcendence in uh, Kashmir Savism. Uh, I invite you, sir, to speak a few words on the lecture. I have unmuted you. Well, thanks, Niharika. And uh, uh, this is really a very wonderful lecture by Rohan Somji on, and uh, he has taken us to the originary sense of uh, thinking, which Greek conceived of. And of course, in Greek philosophy, thinking originates in wonder. That is the original sense of philosophy in Greeks. And he has also brought important, uh, significant, uh, thrown the significant light on the nature of the thinking. That thinking is not as a, as in the modern philosophy, the think uh, as it has been thought as a, in terms of the method, in terms of the cognitive exercise, but rather the originary phenomenological experience of thinking is in the sense of the wonder, which Heidegger, of course, called as the aletheia, because it is only in the aletheia and the unconcealed man, according uh, that thinking originally, according to Heidegger, takes place. So, uh, I, uh, so 
I was also thinking that how Rohan Somji's idea also connects with the Heidegger, what Heidegger had differentiated between the techno thinking as a technological thinking and thinking as a meditative thinking. That how in the technological thinking, you use the thinking to the usefulness. That how the things can come about in the terms of the uh, where thinking can be shown, quantified, measured, and uh, can be accounted for. While the more originary sense of the thinking is comes in the uh, uh, is in the sense of the wonder, that the experience of the being or the experience where the nature un unconceal itself in that wonder, the thinking originally take place where there is no conscious subject will take hold of the thinking, but rather the thinking uh, takes hold of the subject. That is why Heidegger also uh, make the relationship between the thinking and dwelling. That is in the only in the thinking the being dwells. So this is really very interesting discussion. And uh, in question answer uh, session, we would like to hear Rohan Samchi more. But just uh, a small query, which she can of course answer later also. That to what uh, I was also thinking that how do we think of the relationship between the thinking and judging, as Hannah Arendt also talks about that. That uh, uh, that thinking also enable us to judge the situation in the better way, as uh, Arendt say that better person, so that we can differentiate between the beautiful and ugly, uh, good and the bad. So this uh, the thinking enable us to judge better between the uh, ugly and the beautiful. That enable us to come into the world with the better sense of the judgment and to do away with the those kind of the what she called the banality of the evil, which actually turns us into the state of the thoughtfulness. So, with these words, I would uh, again like to thank uh, Rohan Samji and open the floor for the discussion. So, uh, please uh, you can ask the question, comments, and uh, co uh, question, comments, and observation on uh, Rohan Samji's uh, this talk. Um. You may please raise your hands or uh, type your questions in the chat box. I, I will unmute you and uh, I will speak your name. You may proceed to ask the question if you want to raise your hands. The first question is by Tarun Men. Sir. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm audible. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, thanks a lot, Rohan. That was a, a really insightful talk. Um, so. Uh, I guess uh, I want to uh, maybe defend a little bit the more instrumental conception of thinking that you seem to be criticizing. The idea of thinking as directed towards specifically solving problems rather than uh, directed at you know, unconcealing the world or this the idea of thumb design that you were talking about. Um, I, and I, I associate that that notion, the more instrumental notion, with the kind of pra pragmatist tradition uh, in, in in philosophy. Um, and in the, the 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 worry I have about a notion of thinking that focuses on the kind of phenomenology of wonder specifically, that that should be the basis for how we uh, evaluate uh, or for value for that is basis for how we value thinking, is that what actually satisfies our wonder, what actually dissolves the mystery for us subjectively is the correlation with the truth, right? Thing answers that we find satisfactory psychologically. Yeah, yeah Tarun, maybe yeah. we have several questions, so we, we can't see you. We are hoping- Okay, okay. let me just, just, so I just, I just wrap it up there. Yeah, yeah. so I think, I think the, the instrumental yeah. notion Gives a gives a goal for thought that that seems more tied to the idea of truth. That 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 was that's kind of. So funny. what we will do now is uh, I think sharing our thoughts is more important. So let us not get into a question answer mode, but let us take more questions or thoughts from others. Rohan might answer them now, or he might not. But uh, let's let's have a chance for all of us to share our thoughts. That's more important. Thank you. Please raise your hands or uh, please type your questions in the chat box. I'll be able to read out your questions and also unmute you if you want to speak up. There is one question in the chat box already, I think, Nikharika. Yes. Uh, 
yeah there's a uh, question by supriya bajpai sir can you elaborate on how reflection in greek philosophy is different from reflection uh, of john dewey about thinking ma'am would you like to speak your question or oh uh, yeah and could you also explain yeah. am i am i audible yes ma'am you are uh thank you uh, rohan somji for this wonderful lecture i was just uh, like wondering uh, what like uh, because uh, like uh, john dewey also talks about thinking in the similar sense like as you have talked about so can you like just elaborate on because john dewey gives a very methodological way of thinking when he discusses like how we think so like uh, ha- like how like do you distinguish between that way of thinking in from the greek one because the greek one is more like observational based if we look at the greek socratic philosophers so like uh, uh, like how do you like distinguish between or you just throw some light over that issue so uh, i'm not particularly aware about what uh, john dewey's conception of thinking exactly was but uh, what i would i do find uh, peculiar about the greeks Uh, which distinguishes them from uh, most of modern thinkers is that they seem to uh, not exactly always have this idea of an ego ego cogito or uh, have the idea of a subject in mind so when their experience of nature is always uh, as heidegger puts it so immediate uh, when they are thinking they are thinking in response to something they are not thinking in response to a random question that they pose but rather uh, they uh, they are rooted in this uh, they have to be rooted rather to even begin thinking and continue thinking it's only possible in almost this uh, the sense of being rooted so for example the word genius the, the word genius in the greeks which is closely related to the word uh, genie uh, is that there's there's the soul or the spirit which which has uh, the capacity for inspiration or thinking which enters into you and so it is not your brilliant intellect that uh, allows you to think but rather it's it's this genius that has entered you for a moment which is through you expressing uh, what it can see about the truth so thinking in that sense is is a response it's a response to who sees what what the greeks called as nature so now i do not know how uh, i i doubted that john dewey would have uh, such a what, what we would call such a metaphysical uh, uh, explanation of thinking but uh, i think there must be some uh, very strict uh, distinction between the way the greeks thought about thinking and the way john dewey was thought uh thank you there's another question uh, by uh, dr soma shekhar so you may proceed with your question yeah and may i also request uh, dr soma shekhar to be brief in your question can we see you please if possible so that we yeah yeah i, I think i'm visible um thank you uh okay my question uh, rohan firstly uh, thanks very much for that wonderful uh, beginning uh you you said uh, thinking arises with a sense of wonder in uh, taking the examples of all those uh, greek uh, philosophers and you also said uh, thinking uh, begins when something knocks us so in this context i would like to know away from the element of wonder whether intimidation and fear would also serve as the stimulus or trigger for thinking thanks so uh, so for uh, so the way i have understood philosophy is that it has always began with a question now this uh, when i began looking at this questioning uh, this this questioning always uh, has has the sense of converting the mundane into the mysterious so in that sense if if fear or let's say uh, maybe any other negative emotion uh, maybe even anger uh, strikes you and uh, shifts your uh, shift uh, i i spoke about this random shift that occurs and if it if it is able to shift that mundane that you have in front of you into something that is that is mysterious and it reveals uh, from the inside uh, something some some phenomena that we weren't aware of uh, like for hana arendt it was the banality of evil so you you got to see an entirely new phase of evil which you had never encountered before 
and all of that is happening but that that sense of astonishment is still very much there except that astonishment is now triggered with uh, with feelings of horror and fear so yes fear and horror could also very much be the triggers but at the core still astonishment has to lie so thomas in in a sense is a much better word because we are astonished by even little things we are i'll be astonished if uh, something just suddenly falls off the table right now you know but for the greeks the word thomas in is is only related to this this deeper mystery that astonishes you that you stumble upon suddenly the way einstein stumbled upon uh, his entire theory of special relativity is what the greeks would call thomas in that experience is what they would call thomas in. that's my response Uh, yeah thanks you may please proceed with your question it was uh, not more of a question but just a comment like in one of our lectures in heidegger in my university we were talking about this subject object divide and uh, our teacher told us the story about the pharmacon how one of the gods invented this device that we call a pen to write and another god said that oh it's really not an aid for memory it's actually a poison for memory so that was the story behind why the greeks did not write for so many years and it was more about uh, having a communication having a a conversation with people in the street with people in the academy wow so yeah i was i wasn't aware about this fact uh, this is this is quite amazing actually because uh, uh this this whole idea of fusis is also very much uh, deeply related to the kind of uh, mythological thinking that the greeks had and uh, uh, so so uh, my entire talk is very much heavily inspired by heidegger i would say uh, for the heideggerians in the crowd uh, i think they must have noticed this already uh, uh the 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 main uh, for example i constantly kept on referring to uh, heidegger's lecture called uh, what calls for thinking uh there's also another really amazing lecture by uh, richard capo bianco called uh, uh, nature as being where uh, heidegger starts talking about how uh, the kind of relationship that the uh, greeks had with nature and so because their relationship is so very different uh their entire thinking is different and I, i and the reason i brought this topic out as a lecture today was to to bring out this point that uh, the way uh, we are taught generally at least in philosophy schools etc is that philosophy began with socrates and the way we look at pre socratics is that these natural philosophers who were attempting in speculative ways to think about philosophy before socrates but but never really got to it not until socrates got there but this notion can be challenged when we look at mythology is really mythology is revealing a bit more than uh, than what they are supposed to so yeah that that pen thing is uh, is you may want to check it out pandey has a question so we can't see you yes ma'am yes ma'am oh yes can you please hello sir am i audible so my question is uh, uh, there are two three points that i would like to mention here so the indian philosophy uh, i was just Hello? wondering it would be a good idea to just know who people, who you folks are maybe one line of introduction okay very well i am a post graduate in psychology uh, my question at points says first what you have mentioned the as the like thinking emerges as a wonder in psychology we call it as a insight the aha moment and it usually comes when you start with a problem and that problem is somewhere there in your unconscious uh, a lot of experiments have been done and the insight happens as because you have taken that problem inside your head if if i have not pick up the subject the insight won't happen so that that is how psychology explains the insight second is the basic idea of thinking is uh, like we have to validate something uh, so my my question is how do you explain the deductive and inductive reasoning process and third uh, sir the indian philosophy has at its very essence the answer that the nature of atma self is to find answers and that is how we start to think and then the lastly in the subset 
how does this concept of uh, greek thinking explains knowledge about self like my observation my self reflection so these are two three points thank you should we take those are all big questions uh, i'll try to uh, respond as fast as i can and as many as i can uh, so first question so uh, first question was uh, yeah, i remember yeah so in terms of psychology uh, you still start from the divide between the subject and the object which is a, which is a philosophical distinction that that for us it is an assumption an assumption that has been made since the time of uh, rene descartes now uh, uh, even if you drop that assumption when you say that you have to start with the problem how does the problem present to you the uh, for example that that example that i kept on giving uh, the the dark space between the stars that's a problem but that's not a problem unless i conceive it to be a problem and how do i conceive it to be a problem it it cannot simply be me the subject with my uh, with my shell thinking and making up these problems these problems have to in some sense be prompted within me so yeah i agree with the later part where i uh, then go ahead and set it start thinking about it and maybe get to some answers and then maybe in that problem i get to this sense of uh, tao design uh, sorry the sense of uh, wonder but i'm not saying that that you first get into a state of tao design or the sense of wonder and then you start thinking i'm saying that there is something that prompts thinking and in that prompting you unless you experience tao design you can't really begin to think so in this sense uh, there there might be there might be a uh, piece of psychology that uh, that might be able to deal with this in uh, without the the entire subject object distinction so maybe the unconscious is also what uh, the the greeks would refer to as phusis for the greeks the uh, the unconscious revealing itself would, would be equally phusis it would there, there wouldn't be any distinction between the unconscious as here and nature as there nature would have been all entirely available to them uh, including the unconscious now the the part about inductive and uh, deductive arguments for me uh, even uh, even the question that uh, in the beginning was uh, posed by a professor i think over here uh, this this whole argument about reasoning so reasoning uh, it's it's a bit dicey for me right now that reasoning is thinking i'm not saying that reasoning is not thinking but reasoning is not the essence of thinking is what i'm saying over here so reasoning is one of the the the, the instrumental thinking is what is employed in the process of thinking but you never begin thinking with the instrumental way you always be, so so for example if i want to earn money i use an instrumental way of thinking but the thing that even prompts me to have ideas such as this to even begin something like earning money uh comes from a much more deeper level which which is the prompter which is what i'm trying to trace down to now uh, uh, uh is there any other question that i did not sir last question was sir uh, as per the indian philosophy sir the nature of the self has been explained by itself that the curiosity so the this curiosity the nature uh, seeking answers the child the it, it keeps on prompting he keeps on making a reason of himself so this nature of atma from indian philosophy how do you defend it from uh, greek philosophical notions so uh, so since that's an entirely different system uh, it, there won't be a direct uh, correlation or correspondence over here but what what we can still see is that even in that experience of the atma unless you have a direct vivid strong experience of it you will not have these sorts of questions most people uh, who have inherited this tradition and are in tradition uh, do not have questions about atman and the reason they do not have these questions is because they are not struck by the amazon so unless you have this intimate experience with atman which then again for the greeks would be that intimate experience with phusis and i'm no way suggesting that phusis and atman are uh, comparable terms but if their experience is primordially from the phusis then they are struck with the amazon if your experience is primordially from atman then you're struck by that same sense of wonder you still have that same sense of how is it that things exist in the first place what is it that is existing within me who am i these questions again can only present themselves with the full thrust of tao design without tao design these questions are meaningless and only then can you again proceed with the entire uh, indian philosophy so the starting point for even indian philosophy has to be tao design in a sense okay. but but just a last a small question we have time for only one or two questions okay, uh, mr devrath okay. pandey let us give time for others also 
and uh, maybe we can take one or two questions and we'll conclude by 10 and before we conclude we'll ask dr sabra to say a few uh, a few of his thoughts so maybe i think uh, there are uh, two questions uh, there's ma'am there's a question by uh, manu he has uh, written it in the chat box he is asking epistemologically how can one be so sure that the thinking is latter and uh, wonder the former and not vice versa okay and uh, he also says his question has been answered so i guess yes uh, i would still like to respond a little bit to this uh, we will just see if there are any more questions rohan so <laughs> all right okay uh, from ria to everyone what is that uh, that's a comment ma'am all right so if there is no more question then uh, maybe a brief response from you rohan okay so uh, nowhere in my uh, entire lecture did i actually ever suggest that uh, wonder is epistemologically prior to thinking i do not know which is epistemology throughout the process i kept on suggesting that we are not yet thinking that we are still thinking we are in the process of thinking maybe we can think but uh, we do not know if in we what we have encountered so far is that as we as we go further behind in the process of thinking that wonder is one of the major phenomena that is happening over there but this experience of wonder it prompts thinking i can only say that when thinking is already happening so without so the moment the wonder is there the, the thinking is already there so which is epistemologically prior is uh uh in a sense a, a larger question which uh, which is un unanswered right now it's open i think it was open for the greeks now all right uh, thank you uh, rohan and uh, perhaps I, i see maybe there are other questions uh, is there any other question or well it looks like uh, no more questions uh, perhaps uh, may i request dr saurav to conclude and uh, share your thoughts briefly thanks ma'am so um, so this is actually a very interesting and fascinating lecture by rohan semchi and we could see his like uh, the really heideggerian Uh, kind of the engagement with the question of the thinking and uh, uh, this was very fresh and um, uh, and like uh, and especially what he highlighted that especially that how we should think about the philosophy in the pre socratic uh, with the pre socratic philosophy where it arises in the sense of wonder and astonishment so with this words uh, i would like to uh, In, uh, so i would uh, again thanks to hon samki and i would like to invite niharika sharma uh, to give formal vote of thanks uh, ma'am uh, is there any other comment that you want to make uh, or question uh, well uh, nothing really uh, perhaps uh, after you give the vote of thanks then uh, we'll say but i personally also would like to thank rohan for his lecture for starting this friday series and uh, we wish you all the best niharika so since we don't have any further questions i would like to uh, thank uh, dr rohan uh, no <laughs> mr rohan somji for the wonderful lecture and uh, for uh, for an intriguing actually lecture where you brought about great philosophy you took me back to my bachelor's in philosophy in du so i could relate to all that again and i i really want to thank uh, professor sangeeta menon for this unique online uh, lecture series initiative taken by our team and i thank dr saurabh todaria for chairing this session and i'm grateful for all the participants who joined us today for this wonderful lecture uh, we'll see you again um, with a brand new lecture each friday uh, that is uh, via zoom we'll be connecting to you with the new speakers and new lectures and uh, you may please free uh, please feel free to contact us with any further questions suggestions or queries on our nias website site csp site or through our email id uh, ma'am would you also like to say something further uh no i i mean i think you 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 have said everything i only wanted to 
just entice you with the topic for the next lecture, which is, I think Meera would like to say, what is the topic for the next lecture? Yeah. Um, hi again, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rohan, for that very interesting uh, lecture. So the next uh, lecture is going to be by Harish Bhuvan. He is a he is what is known as a therapeutic clown. So that is something that we might not have heard about before. He is a counselor and he also does clowning as a as a part of therapy. So he will be talking to us on the topic a mask. Self sounds fascinating. It is about how. DS people use different masks when we um, when we go about in our daily lives, and how he, as a clown, uses this therapeutic mask uh, as a clown to engage with all those masks that we usually use. So I'm pretty sure it's going to be a very engaging and interesting uh, lecture. So I welcome you all to that lecture as well. Okay. That'll be all. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone and thank you sangeeta ma'am saurabh sir and of course our speaker rohan for the wonderful lecture thank you everyone